Chapter 11 I'm so prepared for unimaginable horror that the reality is almost worse. Dirty money is dripping from the walls. A year's supply of food wasted on marble floors. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical aid poured into fancy furniture and Persian rugs. I feel the artificial heat pouring in through air vents and think of children screaming for clean water. I squint through crystal chandeliers and hear mothers begging for mercy. I see a superficial world existing in the midst of a terrorizing reality, and I can't move. I can't breathe. So many people must have died to sustain this luxury. So many people had to lose their homes and their children and their last five dollars in the bank for promises, 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 so many promises to save them from themselves. They promised us. The reestablishment promised us hope for a better future. They said they would fix things. They said they would help us get back to the world we knew. The world with movie dates and spring weddings and baby showers. They said they would give us back our homes, our health, our sustainable future. But they stole everything. They took everything. My life, my future, my sanity, my freedom. They filled our world with weapons, aimed at our foreheads, and smiled as they shot 16 candles right through our future. They killed those strong enough to fight back and locked up the freaks who failed to live up to their utopian expectations. People like me. Here is proof of their corruption. My skin is cold sweat, my fingers trembling with disgust, my legs unable to withstand the waste, the waste, the waste. The selfish waste in these four walls. I'm seeing red everywhere. The blood of bodies spattered against the windows, spilled across the carpets, dripping from the chandeliers. Juliet. I break. I'm on my knees, my body cracking from the pain I've swallowed so many times, heaving with sobs I can no longer suppress, my dignity dissolving in my tears, the agony of this past week ripping my skin to shreds. I can't ever breathe. I can't catch the oxygen around me and I'm dry heaving into my shirt and I hear voices and see faces I don't recognize, wisps of words wicked away by confusion. Thoughts scrambled so many times I don't know if I'm even conscious anymore. I don't know if I've officially lost my mind. I'm in the air. I'm a bag of feathers in his arms and he's breaking through soldiers crowding around for a glimpse of the commotion and for a moment I don't want to care that I shouldn't want this so much. I want to forget that I'm supposed to hate him, that he betrayed me. That he's working for the same people who are trying to destroy the very little that's left of humanity. And my face is buried in the soft material of his shirt. And my cheek is pressed against his chest. And he smells like strength and courage and the world drowning in rain. I don't want him to ever, 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 ever let go of my body. I wish I could touch his skin. I wish there were no barriers between us. Reality slaps me in the face. Mortification muddles my brain. Desperate humiliation clouds my judgment. Red paints my face, bleeds through my skin. I clutch at his shirt. You can kill me, I tell him. You have guns. I'm wriggling out of his grip and he tightens his hold around my body. His face shows no emotion but a sudden strain in his jaw, an unmistakable tension in his arms. You can just kill me, I plead. Juliet, his voice is solid with an edge of desperation. Please. I'm numb again, powerless all over again. Melting from within, life seeping out of my limbs. We're standing in front of a door. Adam takes a key card and swipes it against a black pane of glass fitted into the small space beside the handle, and the stainless steel door slides out of place. We step inside. We're all alone in a new room. Please don't let go of me. 
Put me down, I tell him. There's a queen-sized bed in the middle of the space, lush carpet gracing the floors, an armoire flush against the wall, light fixtures glittering from the ceiling. The beauty is so tainted, I can't stand the sight of it. Adam gentles me onto the soft mattress and takes a small step backward. You'll be staying here for a while, I think, is all he says. I squeeze my eyes shut. I don't want to think about the inevitable torture awaiting me. Please, I tell him. I'd like to be left alone. A deep sigh. That's not exactly an option. What do you mean? I spin around. I have to watch you, Juliet. He says my name like a whisper. My heart, my heart, my heart. Warner wants you to understand what he's offering you, but you're still considered a threat. He's made you my assignment. I can't leave. I don't know whether to be thrilled or horrified. I'm horrified. You have to live with me? I live in the barracks on the opposite end of this building. With the other soldiers, but yeah. He clears his throat. He's not looking at me. <clears throat> I'll be moving in. There's an ache in the pit of my stomach that's gnawing on my nerves. I want to hate him and judge him and scream forever. But I'm failing because all I see is an eight-year-old boy who doesn't remember that he used to be the kindest person I ever knew. I don't want to believe this is happening. I close my eyes and curl my head into my knees. You have to get dressed, he says after a moment. I pop my head up. I blink at him like I can't understand what he's saying. I am dressed. He clears his throat again but tries to be quiet about it. <clears throat> There's a bathroom through here. He points. I see a door connected to the room, and I'm suddenly curious. I've heard stories about people with bathrooms in their bedrooms. I guess they're not exactly in the bedroom, but they're close enough. I slip off the bed and follow his finger. As soon as I open the door, he resumes speaking. You can shower and change in here. The bathroom. It's the only place there are no cameras. He adds his voice trailing off. There are cameras in my room. Of course. You can find clothes in there. He nods to the armoire. He suddenly looks uncomfortable. And you can't leave? I ask. He rubs his forehead and sits down on the bed. He sighs. You have to get ready. Warner will be expecting you for dinner. Dinner? My eyes are the size of the moon. Adam looks grim. Yeah. He's not going to hurt me? I'm ashamed at the relief in my voice, at the unexpected tension I've released, at the fear I didn't know I was harboring. He's going to give me dinner? I'm starving. My stomach is a tortured pit of starvation. I'm so hungry, so hungry, so hungry. I can't even imagine what real food must taste like. Adam's face is inscrutable again. You should hurry. I can show you how everything works. I don't have time to protest before he's in the bathroom, and I followed him inside. The door is still open, and he's standing in the middle of the small space with his back to me, and I can't understand why. I already know how to use the bathroom, I tell him. I used to live in a regular home. I used to have a family. He turns around very, very slowly, and I begin to panic. He finally lifts his head, but his eyes are darting in every direction. When he looks at me, his eyes narrow, his forehead is tight. His right hand curls into a fist, and his left hand lifts one finger to his lips. He is telling me to be quiet. Every organ in my body falls to the floor. I knew something was coming, but I didn't know it'd be Adam.
I didn't think he'd be the one to hurt me, to torture me, to make me wish for death more than I ever have before. I don't even realize I'm crying until I hear the whimper and feel the silent tears stream down my face, and I'm ashamed, so ashamed. So ashamed of my weakness, but a part of me doesn't care. I'm tempted to beg, to ask for mercy, to steal his gun and shoot myself first. Dignity is the only thing I have left. He seems to register my sudden hysteria because his eyes snap open and his mouth falls to the floor. No, God, Juliet, I'm not... He swears under his breath. He pumps his fist against his forehead and turns away, sighing heavily, pacing the length of the small space. He swears again. He walks out the door and doesn't look back. Chapter 12 Five full minutes under piping hot water. Two bars of soap, both smelling of lavender. A bottle of shampoo meant only for my hair, and the touch of soft, plush towels I dare to wrap around my body. And I begin to understand. They want me to forget. They think they can wash away my memories, my loyalties, my priorities with a few hot meals and a room with a view. They think I am so easily purchased. Warner doesn't seem to understand that I grew up with nothing and I didn't hate it. I didn't want the clothes or the perfect shoes or the expensive anything. I didn't want to be draped in silk. All I ever wanted was to reach out and touch another human being, not just with my hands, but with my heart. I saw the world and its lack of compassion, its harsh, grating judgment, and its cold, resentful eyes. I saw it all around me. I had so much time to listen, to look, to study people and places and possibilities. All I had to do was open my eyes. All I had to do was open a book, to see the stories bleeding from page to page, to see the memories etched onto paper. I spent my life folded between the pages of books. In the absence of human relationships, I formed bonds with paper characters. I lived love and loss through stories threaded in history. I experienced adolescence by association. My world is one interwoven web of words, stringing limb to limb, bone to sinew, thoughts and images all together. I am a being comprised of letters a character created by sentences, a figment of imagination formed through fiction. They want to delete every point of punctuation in my life from this earth, and I don't think I can let that happen. I slip back into my old clothes and tiptoe into the bedroom, only to find it abandoned. Adam is gone, even though he said he would stay. I don't understand him. I don't understand his actions. I don't understand my disappointment. I wish I didn't love the freshness of my skin, the feel of being perfectly clean after so long. I don't understand why I still haven't looked in the mirror, why I'm afraid of what I'll see, why I'm not sure if I'll recognize the face that might stare back at me. I open the armoire. It's bursting with dresses and shoes and shirts and pants and clothing of every kind. Colors so vivid they hurt my eyes. Material I've only ever heard of. The kind I'm almost afraid to touch. The sizes are perfect. Too perfect. They've been waiting for me. The sky is raining bricks right into my skull. I've been neglected, abandoned, ostracized, and dragged from my home. I've been poked, prodded, tested, and thrown in a cell. I've been studied. I've been starved. I've been tempted with friendship only to be left betrayed and trapped into this nightmare I'm expected to be grateful for. My parents, my teachers, Adam, Warner, the reestablishment, I am expendable to all of them. They think I'm a doll they can dress up and twist into prostration. But they're wrong. Warner is waiting for you. 
I spin around and fall back against the armoire, slamming it closed in the craze of panic clutching my heart. I steady myself and fold away my fear when I see Adam standing at the door. His mouth moves for a moment, but he says nothing. Eventually, he steps forward, so forward, until he's close enough to touch. He reaches past me to reopen the door, hiding the things I'm embarrassed to know exist. These are all for you, he says, without looking at me. His fingers touching the hem of a purple dress, a rich plum color good enough to eat. I already have clothes. My hands smooth out the wrinkles in my dirty, ragged outfit. He finally decides to look at me, but when he does, his eyebrows trip his eyes blink and freeze. His lips part in surprise. I wonder if I've washed off a new face for myself and I flush, hoping he's not disgusted by what he might see. I don't know why I care. He drops his gaze, takes a deep breath. I'll be waiting outside. I stare at the purple dress with Adam's fingerprints. I study the inside of the armoire for only a moment before I abandon it. I comb anxious fingers through my wet hair and steal myself. I am no one's property. And I don't care what Warner wants me to look like. I step outside and Adam stares at me for a small second. He rubs the back of his neck and says nothing. He shakes his head. He starts walking. He doesn't touch me and I shouldn't notice, but I do. I have no idea what to expect. I have no idea what my life will be like in this new place. And I'm being nailed in the stomach by every exquisite embellishment, every lavish accessory, every superfluous painting, molding, lighting, coloring of this building. I hope the whole thing catches fire. I follow Adam down a long, carpeted corridor to an elevator made entirely of glass. He swipes the same key card he used to open my door and we step inside. I didn't even realize we'd taken an elevator to get up this many floors. I realize I must have made a horrible scene when I arrived, and I'm almost happy. I hope I disappoint Warner in every possible way. The dining room is big enough to feed thousands of orphans. Instead... There are seven banquet tables draped across the room, blue silk spilling across the tabletops, crystal vases bursting with orchids and stargazer lilies, glass bowls filled with gardenias. It's enchanting. I wonder where they got the flowers from. They must not be real. I don't know how they could be real. I haven't seen real flowers in years. Warner is positioned at the table directly in the middle, seated at the head. As soon as he sees me, Adam, he stands up. The entire room stands in turn. I realize almost immediately that there is an empty seat on either side of him, and I don't intend to stop moving, but I do. I take quick inventory of the attendees and can't count any other women. Adam brushes the small of my back with three fingertips, and I'm startled out of my skin. I hurry forward, and Warner beams at me. He pulls out the chair on his left and gestures for me to sit down. I do. I try not to look at Adam as he sits across from me. You know, there are clothes in your armoire, my dear. Warner sits down beside me. The room reseats itself and resumes a steady stream of chatter. He's turned almost entirely in my direction, but somehow the only presence I'm aware of is directly across from me. I focus on the empty plate two inches from my fingers. I drop my hands in my lap. And you don't have to wear those dirty tennis shoes anymore, Warner continues, stealing another glance before pouring something into my cup. It looks like water. I'm so thirsty I could inhale a waterfall. I hate his smile. Hate looks just like everybody else until it smiles. 
until it spins around and lies with lips and teeth carved into the semblance of something too passive to punch. Juliet? I inhale too quickly. A stifled cough is ballooning in my throat. His glassy green eyes glint in my direction. Are you not hungry? Words dipped in sugar. His gloved hand touches my wrist and I nearly sprain it in my haste to distance myself from him. I could eat every person in this room. <sniffs> no, thank you. He licks his bottom lip into a smile. Don't confuse stupidity for bravery, love. I know you haven't eaten anything in days. Something in my patience snaps. I'd really rather die than eat your food and listen to you call me love, I tell him. Adam drops his fork. Warner spares him a swift glance, and when he looks my way again, his eyes have hardened. He holds my gaze for a few infinitely long seconds before he pulls a gun out of his jacket pocket. He fires. The entire room screams to a stop. My heart is flapping wings against my throat. I turn my head very, very slowly to follow the direction of Warner's gun, only to see he shot some kind of meat right through the bone. The platter of food is slightly steaming across the room, the meal heaped less than a foot away from the guests. He shot it without even looking. He could have killed someone. It takes all of my energy to remain very, very still. Warner drops the gun on my plate. The silence gives it space to clatter around the universe and back. Choose your words very wisely, Juliet. One word for me, and your life here won't be so easy. I blink. Adam pushes a plate of food in front of me. The strength of his gaze is like a white-hot poker pressed against my skin. I look up and he cocks his head the tiniest millimeter. His eyes are saying, please. I pick up my fork. Warner doesn't miss a thing. He clears his throat a little too loudly. He laughs with no humor as he cuts into the meat on his plate. Do I have to get Ken to do all my work for me? Excuse me? It seems he's the only one you'll listen to. His tone is breezy, but his jaw is unmistakably set. He turns to Adam. I'm surprised you didn't tell her to change her clothes like I asked you to. Adam sits up straighter. I did, sir. I like my clothes, I tell him. I'd like to punch you in the eye is what I don't tell him. Werner's smile slides back into place. No one asked what you like, love. Now eat. I need you to look your best when you stand beside me.